Hey there everyone, we're about to show you an interview with a mathematical biologist called Kit Yates. It's about coronavirus. If you'd like to see a longer version, a full 28 minute podcast, I'll put that on the Number File 2 YouTube channel, as I usually do. And you can also listen to the podcast in all the usual ways. Just search for Number File, and it's the episode called Gondor Calls for Aid. So my name's Kit Yates. I'm a mathematical biologist. I'm also a senior lecturer at the University of Bath. And so by a mathematical biologist, I think people find that a bit of a strange one to deal with because I think people think that typically maths is quite pure and abstract and biology is pretty messy in real world and never the twain shall meet. But um, really what I do day to day is take biological systems that I think are interesting. So maybe anything from a swarm of locusts to the way that eggs get their patterning or the way that embryos develop and try and write down a system of equations or computer code which describe that to try and make predictions about those systems. Kit, you say that people don't often see the link between biological systems and mathematics. I feel like that's changed pretty rapidly in the last few weeks. Right, everyone is talking about exponential growth, about epidemic, epidemiological models, about um, modelling and basic reproduction numbers. Like Boris Johnson was talking about the fast upward tick of the curve. And uh, yeah, even Conor McGregor I saw the other day was talking about implementing harsh measures to halt exponential growth of the disease in Ireland. So yeah, everyone is, uh, everyone is talking about mathematical biology at the moment. So it's a good time to be a mathematical biologist. Is there a degree of that? I know, I know I'm sure if you had a magic wand, you would make this all go away. And what a terrible thing this is for the world. But are mathematicians kind of thinking, at last, people get it. I, th- I think that's true. I think people, like, there's there's a good meme going around where it's just a, a guy standing at a chalkboard drawing an exponential curve and students saying, oh, when are we ever going to need this, right? And yeah, it's sort of the case. It sort of feels like, to some extent, a little bit of vindication, although, yeah, of course... Um, ideally you would wish it away if you could do but yeah I think mathematicians are are trying to um, make the most of this opportunity and and to try and show people why maths really can be important it can be a matter of life and death sometimes so do you feel like this has shown up sort of a problem with mathematical literacy or do you think people have kind of risen to the occasion and they're getting it like how have you felt about how well the public are understanding some of these things before we do start talking about them ourselves. Yeah, I think um, I think people are, are doing an okay job actually. I think the fact that people are even talking about it and caring about, you know, how good these models are and asking these questions is a really good sign. Um, I think it's it's a little bit difficult to to explain all the really complex models that are that are out there at the moment. But I think that actually the the basic mathematical models that underlie epidemiological spread are actually not too difficult to understand in fairly fairly straightforward terms. And I think as, as it's our job as maths communicators to try and make those things as as understandable as possible. And I think there's a lot of good people out there working really hard to do that. Coronavirus. Let's deal with that for a second. That's exponential growth. At the moment, yeah. Like, so the way these, the simplest mathematical epidemiological models work is you, you, bake, you, you break the population down into three different compartments. They're called susceptibles, so people who haven't had the disease, infectives, so people who have the disease and can infect it, other people. And then we have this removed category. It's sort of a euphemistic term for people who have recovered, but also people that have died as well. This is the SIR model we here talked about. Right, this, the, yeah, we usually call it SIR, but yes, yeah, uh, whatever you want to call it, really. Yeah. Um, and we, at the very early stages, you have a whole bunch of people who are susceptible to the disease and very few people who are infected. And so um, each individual can, can go and infect a certain number of people who are susceptible. We call this the basic reproduction number of the disease. And if that number of people that they infect over the course of their infectious period is greater than one, then they will on average infect that many people who will then go and infect that many people again. So for, for COVID at the moment, um, estimates of the basic reproduction number are between one and a half and four. So it's quite a big window. Um, but 2.5 is a generally sort of acceptable number. So the first person goes and infects two and a half other people. They're going to infect two and a half more and two and a half more. And the, and the, uh, the exponential uh, growth then occurs. You, get, you start to see the numbers growing exponentially. What kind of jobs are mathematicians doing at the moment like i can see what i can see the job of doctors and i can see the the job of researchers trying to come up with vaccines i mean the these graphs and models you're talking about have been known long before covid came along and they obviously they're being applied now 
But are there day-to-day things mathematicians can be doing, like new work they can be doing to help in this battle? Yeah, absolutely, because every disease is different, right? And these these simple models that, that I've sort of described, this SIR model, they can be made infinitely more complex, right? So SIR is fine for some very simple diseases, but actually there's extensions that we can make to those SIR models to include things like a carrier class. So people who have the disease, but aren't um, aren't necessarily showing symptoms. So they're not necessarily um, showing, you wouldn't class them as infected because you don't know they're infected yet, but they've had this asymptomatic period, which is what's happening with COVID. And so they can be spreading it without you even knowing that they're infected. And that can be, that can be a real problem. And it has been a real problem with COVID because we can't just isolate people as soon as they show symptoms we have to be isolating everyone in case they've got symptoms so that's just one really simple extension you can make but adding in things like noise so stochasticity or randomness in the way that people bump into each other taking account of the networks with which people interact with each other can make a huge difference as well you get these um, people who are social hubs and therefore will spread the disease to lots of people compared to people who are stuck at home and, and don't go out so much so you can make these things arbitrarily complex and there's actually been a call by the Royal Society for rapid uh, assistance in modelling pandemics where all mathematicians, especially applied mathematicians who have familiarity with modelling, can sign up and, and help out in this cause. So, yeah, there's loads to be done at the moment and we're, we're keeping really busy. How does someone build in something like these these you know these hub super spreader type people as opposed to people who are locked away? Like, I see that they exist. But how would you put them into a model, these sort of unmeasurables or like, or I, I see you could guess at what they are, but then how do you? So they're not necessarily unmeasurables. We actually know a lot, a lot about our social structure in part from using social networking data, but also just there's been a number of studies done and you can actually classify um, the way that people interact using a network. So people are nodes in that network and their connections to other people are, are edges. And so you can classify uh, what's called the degree distribution of that network, which tells you how many people are there who have 100 contacts, how many people with 99, 98 and so on, how, down to how many people are there with no contacts. And that distribution can tell you a great deal about the way that people interact so you can incorporate that network modeling into these SIR models so you you know you start the disease off in a particular node with you know a particular connectivity how many people do they actually interact with and you see how it spreads around the network so they they may seem almost intangible but actually if we have good enough data and this is what it all comes down to really if we have good enough data then we can actually capture capture these behaviors but data at the moment on this emerging pandemic is really difficult to come by. I mean, it seems pretty obvious that this pandemic is going to leave a scar on the world and have some kind of some kind of long lasting effect. What about mathematically? Do you think it's going to have a mathematical legacy? Is it going to like because math because I've never seen mathematics being talked about so much with a global news event? Yeah, exactly. I think I hope it will draw people into mathematics and make people realise that you know, you uh, if you become a mathematician, you can have a real impact on the world. You're not just sat behind a desk writing a textbook for you know for a subject which is dead and gone. You're actually living in the real world, and you're you're doing things which can have a real important impact on people's lives. So I hope that people, future generations of of kids who are studying maths in school at the moment, will say, "Wow, this is actually." this living breathing exciting subject and i want to be part of that and so i hope we'll get more people into mathematics and i also hope that people will take maths a little bit more seriously themselves so maths generally only gets in the news when it's you know the fields medals times and and you know people struggle to understand the the very complicated maths that the field medals have won the maths for but actually you know at the moment we can tell people about relatively straightforward mathematical models which are having a huge impact on their everyday lives and suggesting how we have come to this unprecedented lockdown that we've never you know we've never seen before so um yeah hopefully it will have a really big impact on on, on people's lives just a reminder, the full 28-minute podcast, Numberphile 2, also numberphile.com, or search Numberphile on your podcast player of choice. I'll also put some links in the video description to some useful videos and information, including the Numberphile video with Ben Sparks about the coronavirus curve, and great ones from some other creators as well. And just a quick Numberphile update, before everything went into lockdown, we actually did manage to film lots and lots of Numberphile videos, normal ones, not Skype calls. We're editing them at the moment and they'll be appearing in your feeds very soon. Thanks very much for watching and I hope you're all staying really safe.